It is Loveline. I'm Adam. That is not Dr. Drew. That's Dr. Bruce, who, uh, if you listen to the show with any regularity, you know him as Dr. Spaz. He's <laughs> filling in for Dr. Don't Drew. Start. Filling in for Dr. Drew tonight, who is uh, God knows where making uh, what kind of money while he's getting paid for this show simultaneously. What a genius. Just signed our three-year contract, and the next day, signed it last night, the next day he's off. Good business. Chasing a nickel in Poughkeepsie <laughs> while he's on the clock here. I think we should dock him. But uh, be that as it may, Dr. Bruce is just as qualified as Dr. Drew. You want to go through my qualifications? Uh, addiction medicine. Uh -huh. You know that. Yes. Oh, yeah. You uh, know emergency medicine. Oh, yeah. You remove tattoos from inmates. I well, the laser is a he knows the laser well of youth for all people. Can remove uh, those teardrop tats from those of you who've uh, done time and don't want to uh, advertise that to the world. And F the LAPD from the forehead, that's a good point. And F the LAPD from the forehead of uh, some of the other good folks that have been uh, incarcerated. Can I say hi to the guys at uh, California Youth Authority in Chino? Well, only if they My promise brothers. not to kill me if and when they're paroled. Hey, they're rehabilitated. All right, and what else do you do? That's it, right? Emergency, addiction, tattoos. Yeah, laser. That's good. That's yeah. enough. And I have my boards in internal medicine, of course. Right. Which makes right. me as qualified as All right. Tonight, uh, we're talking uh, a little bit of uh, racing. The uh, It's the IRL series, right? Yes? That's correct. I'm, I'm good. Uh, Eddie Cheever Jr. is here. And uh, Philippe Giafone. Giaf it's Giafone or Giafoni? Giafoni. Giafoni, that's better. Giafoni uh, is the uh, was a rookie of the year last year, and of course uh, Eddie Cheever's uh, Eddie Cheever. And I, I was reading uh, on your uh, chart here, uh, Eddie, that uh, you that's were. That's not a medical chart, is it that you're reading? Or... No, oh. <laughs> but uh, we can pull that up via the internet uh, later on and really get into the uh, the ins and outs. But uh, this guy, uh, let's see, what's say 132, 132 uh, Grand Prix races. More than uh, Mario Andretti, more than Dan Gurney, that's uh, that's pretty good. Is that is that true? Oh, well, if it's if it, anything, if you it's haven't written you yet, if anything is written, it's true. Uh, <laughs> Jesus I, I, Christ! I, I have been racing for quite some time though. I, the other day, I was uh, I, some kid walked up and said, "I saw your dad race in, in Monaco." And obviously, it wasn't my dad; it was me. <laughs> just a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, people do that with Drew. They go, well, we used to hear your dad on the radio show 15 years ago. They say, no, that's my career stalled 1984. Well, unacceptable. No, unacceptable. it is. And uh, so the Indy, uh, or now, can we call it the Indy series or we call it the IRL series? What are you more comfortable with? Indy I, I, Racing League Series. Indy. These are the cars that race at Indy. These are the drivers right. that race at Indy. Good thing about Indy, you never have to explain it to anybody. Right. And I, I know there was always some problem with, uh, I don't know, CART and Formula One or CART and Indy many years ago. But mm -hmm. I, I think most of the uh, lay people understand the Indy 500, and these are the cars that race in that competition. And uh, the series is going to start on uh, March 2nd, and it goes through uh, September 15th with, uh, of course, the Indianapolis 500 somewhere in the middle there, a little closer to the front. And what are you guys out here doing now? Are you testing? We were just testing um, today in Fontana. It's the, it was the first day. It's called the Test in the West. So we all got down to Fontana and tested. Now tomorrow we travel over to Phoenix, and we have our second test in uh, in Phoenix, and and how does that work? You're, you 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 obviously your sponsors bring the cars out. And you try to dial them in, essentially. Yeah, we, we every every team every team in racing is sponsored or has corporates corporations that push it because we we are uh, we are obviously dressed in their colors. You go out right. there. I mean, our car is the Red Bull Infinity car, right. and uh, Felipe's car is a Hollywood car, uh, which is um, a cigarette from Brazil, and, and Penske has Marlboro, so we're all dressed in our different colors, and we got there, and we do battle, and the fastest car wins, and, and it's a hell of a technical battle. At the end of the day, it's about um, people competing in the fastest racing cars in the world on, yeah, on what, locals in the States. What is, what is the fastest track that you guys run on? I, th I think it's still Indy. Um, 
I think we'll be qualifying at any this year in excess of 226 mile an hour average. That means you'll be about you'll be 234, 235 on, straight on the straights. Yeah, Jeez, it's uh, it's incredible. And and don't they? I mean, you did they have restrictions and things, right? I mean, there's certain little things you you, you could go faster if it was completely unlimited. Is that? Is well, that it, it one, I mean, they do put rules in. I think the rules are more are put in place because. Ooh, there is no need to put drivers at silly risk. And no, I'm, I'm two not. two thirty something is is fast enough. I'm just saying it's 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 uh, it, it's even possible uh, to go faster sure. if it was not for some. I don't know. They have rules for yeah. weight or displacement or um, some of the uh, things involving aerodynamics or like some of the wings and scoops and Absolutely. that kind of stuff. I, I could probably walk to the third floor of this building and jump off and maybe make it. <laughs> I mean, you never you got to try it once, but you never know. The thing with driving at Indy is that you are you are participating in in an incredibly difficult event, and I think they have to put rules in place that are responsible. You can't oh, be. You can't be I, I actually Absolutely. have the record at Indy for 236 average. 236.1 average in the race, and I remember turning into the corners at 250 miles an hour and thinking, if if so much as a fly hits the car in the wrong place, you're going to spin off and, and hit a wall. That's It's just it's silly. So that's the good thing about the Indy Racing League is they've gone out of their way to make sure it's a good, safe show and the drivers aren't put at unnecessary risk. What are they, uh, do you guys shift on the wheel or do you shift down, down below? Uh, to a side. To the side. It's like yeah. a sequential, it's sequential, like a motorcycle. Straight, yeah, back is up a gear and forward is downshifting. But if you if you're downshifting in an Indy car, it's bad, bad you're times. deep. Is they're going to be passing you really quickly? <laughs> Wait a minute. Did we just hear the S word there, Anderson? All right. Come on. This isn't the. Uh, it's a racing here. term, Adam. That's oh, I see. <laughs> it almost sounded like ship. Shift. I said you're deep in shift. Jeez. Oh, deep in shift. <laughs> That's right. You're deep in the shift. Yeah, yeah, you're down shifting. Down shifting. <laughs> All right. And do you guys do, uh, are there courses that are like kind of, are they all ovals or are there any like road courses? We only race on ovals. No, uh, no, uh, that's all, is that all lefts? All left. All right. Uh, if you go right in the, that's, you're, that's trouble. you're leaving the track. Yeah. It is a, it is an amazing, uh, absolutely uh, amazing event. How many people show up for that 500 just in person? How many are there? Uh, 450, 500. A thousand, that is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's his, it's his, uh, it's pr probably the biggest spectator event in the United States. Not, not far. probably. It is. Yeah. It is the largest spectator. Uh, how can I say event? Well, now that since the XFL is folded, <laughs> I think it is now officially <laughs> taken over the number one slot. <laughs> I remember when the uh, Reno Gamblers were uh, playing the uh, Argonauts. Of, the only one that remembers of uh, Salem, Mass. And that was pretty big, pretty big turnout. This is the guys who wanted to people. take this call. Oh, okay, Molly. Uh huh. You're uh, 17. Yeah. What's up? Um, I was having sex with this guy in the shower the other day, and he used a condom, and I wanted to know if that was safe. Yeah. Hey, well, as far as we know, it is. Did, did he uh, did he put a I usually put a scoop of water in there to kind of help the cause. He, he didn't did he do that? I don't think so. No. And uh who is this guy? My friend. Oh, I see. And uh do you, do you like him? Uh yeah. All right. Well, maybe you guys uh maybe be boyfriend and girlfriend, right? Probably not. Why not? He has a girlfriend. Oh. <laughs> yeah. What's going on with that? Uh, I don't know, but I don't know. So it's a guy with healthy boundaries. Yeah. Yeah. He's like, listen, I did not nail her on dry land. <laughs> so uh, why in the shower, by the way? Mm, that's just where we were. I see. Boy, you, you really tell a uh, fascinating story there, Molly. Yeah. All right. So you're 17, right? Uh-huh. Why, why you sound older? Have you, you been through a lot? Mm, no. Okay. How old's the guy? I think seventeen or eighteen. So are you are you feeling a little guilty about uh, being involved with somebody that already has a girlfriend? Yeah, I am, and so is he. All right. So, so he'll never do it again. No, just oral. That's yeah. his new. Uh, <laughs> made that proclamation last time they spoke. All right, hey Molly. Uh huh. Why, why don't you you get a boyfriend for yourself? I'm working on that. All right. 
And uh, I think you can. I think the condom works okay in the shower, condoms, right? Condoms work in in various bodies of water. And the issue being, well, look, you, I I remember smuggling uh, almost a kilo of heroin into uh, Mexico, <laughs> and that was in a condom, and that was up my ass for like three days, and no problems at all. Well, so I I, I couldn't see why you couldn't use one in a shower. Yeah. The, the problem with condoms, some studies have shown up to 26%. See, Ed, Eddie's going, why did I get beeped for saying the S word well, five minutes ago? You have it down to a scientist. Right. I can and can't say. But I've had up, anal sex and I've passed out a couple of times. Bruce, please, the mics are hot. Go ahead. Up to 26% of the time in some studies, condoms don't work, mostly because of user inability to properly yeah. monitor their position. And uh, What do you guys do when you're trapped in that <clears> car for long periods of time and you have to relieve yourself? Do you just? I, I'm really <laughs> glad we've actually changed gear and gone yeah. to a different we, question we here because when you looked up. at me and started <laughs> saying something, I thought, I don't know where to hide right now. <laughs> yeah, so, when you have to relieve yourself? Yeah. I mean, you, you, can you get out of the car? No. I mean, once, once, the race start, the, once the race starts, you're in. You're in. I mean, I, I don't know. I, I heard... Felipe release himself in the car, but I would never do something like that. <laughs> no, yeah, no, no. no, that is word, 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 word has it. Yeah. Is that on is his that resume? It is uh, about the third page. It, it alludes to it. It doesn't specifically <laughs> outline it, but uh, yeah, yeah, it drinks uh, too much. Oh no, wait, you don't drink the Red Bull. You smoke the Hollywood cigarettes. That's, I drink. That's right. <laughs> That's right. RJ. Yes. You're uh, 18. Yeah. What's up? Um. Yeah. My question was. Uh, Basically about enemas and uh, oh please come on let's clean this show up a little doctor <laughs> we have continuing the line of uh, no, comedy let's, for let's, you let's take a let's take something for our, for our guests they don't well, that's a medical question actually that's, they don't want to talk about enemas no. we'll talk to them in two minutes okay. Keith hey you're thirty I got I got a question for your guest yeah all right Eddie uh, you say uh, Red Bull's one of your sponsors that's right I bet a half a can of that will keep you going for the entire race. Mm, that's that correct. Wrong. Yeah, it yeah. is. I mean, I I think it's uh, I think it's great. They say it oh, gives you wings, and it ain't, they ain't lying. I I know one thing. When I drink Red Bull, I gotta have something to do. If I don't have something to do, I'm gonna be going crazy. So well, you just pick it yourself. You know, well, you can do a million things. D uh, doctor, it's your choice. Doctor Drew's wife's drink is Red Bull and vodka. By the way, which uh, uh -huh. I hear works out pretty good. I I don't know. I've never had it, but apparently the people people do this with the vodka. And it's pretty good. It I did it for my honeymoon. It's you did? Good. Yeah. You did the did the Red Bull and vodka? Not bad. Oh yeah. It's Somebody's marketing a drink. Alcohol right. and Red together. Bull. Yeah. I don't know if it's, hey Keith. Since we just did like a 60 second commercial, can I get a case of it or something? <laughs> yes, <laughs> but it's going to be open. <laughs> what's your what's, what's your other question, question there, Keith? All right. Um, been seeing a girl. I wouldn't say necessarily she's a girlfriend, but I've been dating her for about six months now, and yet I still continue to hook up with other girls. You know, make out, not necessarily like uh, have sex with, but I still tend to have this selfish tendency to want to hook up with other girls. And I just want to know if that's a sign of addictive personality, if that's something that can ever be fixed. What's your comment on that? Well, how long have you been seeing her? Like six months. And are you committed? I think she thinks so more than I do. But I, I think we, we kind of just haven't talked enough about that kind of stuff. Well, I mean, she's just assuming through your actions because you're, you're having sex with her, right? Yes. And so she just she's just doing the math and assuming you guys are committed and you're not going to tell her otherwise. Exactly. But it doesn't sound like you're that into her. I'm very into her. It's just that I have this, like I said, selfish part of me that wants to still hook up and have have my cake and eat it too, basically. Well... I mean, do you think you, you mean you're 30 years old? Do you think you want to get married to her? The thoughts cross my mind. She's pretty good people. You yeah. know, it's interesting you use the word addictive because you've obviously made the self observation that what you're doing is not totally within your control. It's probably a pattern you've had in other relationships. And, you know, yeah. one of the reasons when, when kids call in and they're, and they're fooling around and they're fooling around with more than one person once, even at a much younger age, a lot of these things turn into patterns. And, what we know of addiction now is very interesting. Your brain actually changes. You're, we call it plasticity. And we used to think that when you had an addictive problem or a behavior that you tended to pursue against your own will at times, uh, you know, that it was just a, a bad habit. But it turns out your brain actually changes its connection so that it seems more normal when you're doing something like that eventually to continue to do it. And uh, changing takes uh, actually work and a lot of effort. And when we refer you to a therapist for something like this, uh, two things. First of all, it's not just going and uh, 
uh, having them give you advice, they help you to work to overcome a problem like this. And secondly, they get into issues of like, what was your relationship with, with your mom or, or in your family of origin? So, you know, I'd wonder what was going on in your, what your parents' relationship was like, what you saw when you were growing up. And uh, Yeah. Well, how was that? Good stuff. I, I mean, I, it is a pattern. And I had a great family life growing up, so I don't really think that that um, is a source of it. Um, well, maybe, maybe just an a-hole. True. I mean, man, some guys are selfish. Yeah, but he's calling in. He sounds like he's got a conscience, and he doesn't want to continue that behavior. But it's not just going to go. You're not just going to wake up one day and say, hey, I'm not going to do this anymore. It's going to be something. Just like with addictions, you can realize you have a problem and decide you want to quit, but there's a road you have to take that involves work. Well, listen, if you know what you're doing and you don't like what you're doing, or you at least know it's wrong, then uh, feel free to stop. But, Adam, let's, let's be honest. I like it at the time it's happening. Right. Yeah, all right, but it's that way with everything that's bad for you. Right. Everything is everything that's bad for you is good at the time. I don't know why. I don't know. You're going to need some help. With the, that was. You're going to need some help with the problem and the fact that it does feel good. If you talk to anybody that does have another kind of addiction, and there is definitely a connection between this and any other kind of chemical addiction, what you're doing makes makes you feel good in a part of your brain that's the same part of the brain that cocaine or another chemical would. Right, Bruce, let's not save everybody. Can we save it? Can we try no, and save this? No, okay, so I, I can tell I'm not going to get much further. Go to a therapist. No, you, you realize you have the problem. you got somebody that sounds like a good woman. If you want to save this relationship, uh, you're either going to have a disaster that's going to make you depressed and lead you to a therapist, or you're going to go on your own. I go on your own. And he may, he may end up in SA, meaning sex, Sexaholics Anonymous. or Well, there, there's where you can get laid. <laughs> I want to ask uh, Eddie and uh, Philippe something. I was just seeing, uh, I don't know what I was watching, some uh, TV show maybe I was watching. Uh, I watch about 20 hours of uh, speed vision every, every... <laughs> That's an addiction. Oh, my God. <laughs> it's more addictive than the actual speed... <laughs> is I you, you know the two things that have uh, oh, destroyed my life is the TiVo and then the Speed Vision, because all of a sudden um, it's four thirty in the morning and I'm watching motor motorcycle ice racing from Finland and I'm <laughs> live <laughs> live and I'm standing up <laughs> cheering and I'm making plans. I got to get me an ice bike. <laughs> it's, it's a ridiculous channel. I can't stand. I watch all those ridiculous hot rod shows and all that uh, dream car garage and all these. So all I do is watch every commercials for wax. I don't mm. care. I watch that. But uh, they, they had some sort of like a round table, and I think they were talking about Formula One at the time, but they were talking about putting essentially black boxes in cars, like what they have for airplanes, so that they can monitor what goes wrong or what the impact was if there's an accident, or even to the point where they're talking about doing adjustments while the car's in motion from the, from the pit area. I don't know, maybe leaning it out or richening it up or something like that. Is there any been any discussion with the Indy cars about uh, doing like a black box? We actually have a box like that in our cars that measures the impact. We've done a lot of work to make the cars safer, and a lot of money has been spent in time studying the accidents. The fastest way to learn how to make a car safer is to study and see what happens after it's had, had an accident. This box that we have measures what we call the G-force loading. In right. other words, if you take a billiard board ball and you throw it at a wall, there's energy, kinetic energy, that has to be dissipated someplace. And the worst place to dissipate that energy is in the human body. So everything around you has got to break. Right. Um, and by and, and the, the best accidents are the ones where you see the tires flying off, the car flipping. The worst ones are the ones that are just a cold, hard thud because it all goes into the driver. But right. we, it is illegal to modify any action in the car right. from the pits. Otherwise, you, you might as well just put a monkey in it and, and you know, they'll decide to go in the corner a little bit faster, a little bit slower. So right. I, re I remember discussions in Formula 1 when I was I racing would watch 10 years the, ago. By the way, if that was on Speed Vision, monkey racing, monkey racing. I would watch that. <laughs> <laughs> monkey ice motorcycle racing from uh, Helsinki. I'd be up watching that, too. Yeah, what, what, what were you saying before I uh, cut you off about, uh, about years ago you uh, saw something or heard something? No, it, years ago that was a problem in Formula One. It had gotten to the fact that it was so technical that, that the engine manufacturers wanted to modify some settings in the engine when they saw something was failing. And I remember the FIA, the, Italian, the, the International Federation of Automobile, uh, passed a rule saying that you couldn't do that. We... Whatever happens in the car is sent over in telemetry to the pit so they know what's going on. So they have a, they have a screen where they can see right. your engine is failing. I have a sensor in my tire 
that sends a signal every quarter of a second saying your tire still has good tire pressure. So I have a warning if something goes wrong. Right. So you, you don't, you really don't want to have that. You really want to stay away from that. Well, I, uh, yeah, and then they were speculating that guys from the other teams could pick up the signal and adjust the guy's engine and <laughs> screw it up and that the monkey would then crash into the wall. It was, uh, it was quite a debacle. But I, uh, I, the thing that amazes me about uh, racing and talking about the uh, safety is just uh, looking, watching the speed vision, watching these races from the 50s, 60s, even 70s. I mean, they, they barely had the notion of the crash helmet down in the 50s. You know, they had that sort of half thing that went on top with the leather ear flaps and no roll bars and uh, no seat belts. And it just... I. I, I, you know, I've talked about it on the show a million times. I think it had to be bravado as far as, like, the roll bar goes. I, mean, I got a good story for you. Yeah, let's hear it. Sterling Moss. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you've seen him on, sure. on Speed Vision. He was an Englishman. Probably, I, I would say, probably one of the top three drivers in the world. And I'm talking Fanjo, Senna, uh, drivers of, of that <gasps> category in Formula 1. Right. Um, he did not want to wear seat belts in the beginning because he thought it was safer if he had an accident that he'd get catapulted out of the car. Yeah, well... Now, now looking back and thinking about that now, you'd think, well, I mean, what were you smoking? I mean, Jesus, why would you want to get catapulted out of a car going 120 miles an hour? So the good thing about racing is that a lot of this technology that we have developed, right. seat belts, uh, uh, disc brakes, uh, right. all of that does get passed on in, in safety. So... Your your point is well taken. I'm sure you're looking at the cars now. Twenty years from now, you'll say, "What what, what sort of they were wearing a carbon fiber helmet? Were they crazy? They could have used right. some new polymer or something." Well, uh, and also though, I mean, he had a point about getting thrown out of the car because they couldn't figure out the goddamn roll bar. So it was like you'd get your head taken uh. off if you stayed uh, in the car. But uh, anyway, uh, I've uh, talked about that way too many times on this show for a uh, non-racing show. Why don't we uh, take ourselves a little break? When we come back, we'll speak to you. Want to talk to the anima person when we come back? I'd be more than happy to. Or we'll let uh, we'll <gasps> let the, we'll let the uh, the racers pick I, a call. I, th I think Felipe should really talk about the anima thing. Felipe, <laughs> you know, where, where are you from, Felipe? Brazil. So that's a way of life over there, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. Uh, it's all in the, it's all in the flag. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Not seen the flag. We got to. All right, we'll uh, take ourselves a little break. We'll be right back. Yep. Oh, there you go. Hey, uh, Anderson, you know, I can't read your hands sometimes when you point it and you keep it in front of you because I lose it in your face. You know, I see that. Yeah, you do that big wave thing. I told you that's why I got in the radio, so I get that big arm arm finger you give me. All right, it is uh, Love Line. I'm Adam Carolla. That is uh, Dr. Bruce over there filling in for Dr. Drew, who is uh, off somewhere else, but will be uh, back tomorrow. I'll uh, also be here tomorrow, except for I won't be here. I'll be in uh, Vegas, and uh, Drew will be somewhere else. But don't worry. We will deliver. Eddie Cheever Jr. is here, and uh, Philippe Giafoni. <clears throat> Eddie Cheever has been uh, racing cars since, uh, well, since uh, just a couple of years before the car was invented. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Philippe was uh, Rookie of the Year last year in the uh, Indy series, the uh, IRL series. So uh, these guys have uh, been around the track uh, just a few times at uh, speeds well over 200 miles an hour. And uh, Jesus, what a sport. And talk about, uh, you know, the thing that's amazing about, like, uh, the Indy 500 is uh, that race goes on for f some hours, right? Is it like three hours? Three hours? Three and a half. Three and a half hours. Uh, that's, uh, I mean, it's all focused. You know what I mean? I mean, uh, you can't blink for three and a half hours. That's the part that's pretty incredible about the whole thing. The beauty about the Indy 500 is that there's 33 drivers that start, and they've had to work their... What words can we use here? Can you word... Tokai. Their Tokai off <laughs> um, to qualify for the race. And at the end of that afternoon, there will be a new Indianapolis 500 winner. And people all over the world will acknowledge that as having won the most important car race of the year. And you won in 98? Uh-huh. That uh, must have been nice, uh, drinking the milk and uh, doing that whole thing. Yeah, well, the, the hard thing is is that you race for three and a half hours. You're incredibly focused. You have eight pit stops to make. You can't make a screw up. And and then you get down to those last ten laps, and uh, your crew's counting down nine, eight, seven, six, five, and this tension builds, and you're breaking away from the pack, and you... 
you're you're totally exhausted but you don't know it because you've been driving so hard you finish you cross the line and you realize it's like a big balloon all this all this air goes out of it and you realize that you just won the most important race of your life and then you drive into the pits and you've been by yourself for three and a half hours you've been dodging bullets and hand grenades and ducking and weaving and almost bouncing off things and you come into the pits and and all of a sudden ABC will stick a microphone in your face, and you're expected to say something intelligent. I mean, you're, you have yeah. all these people. There's all this quiet goes over the over yeah. the speedway, and, and it's very hard. I mean, I so you get the milk, and I drank the milk in a hurry, and I slobbered it all. And when uh, so the whole afternoon is over, and I call my uh, my young son, and uh, and I'm always giving him a hard time because every time he eats, half the food lands on the floor. He didn't say I thought I was going to have this male bonding session with right. my son. You know, I've just won the Indy 500, and my son's going to tell me what a great dad I am. And he said, Dad, you're a pig. <laughs> you slobbered the milk everywhere. So that was my uh, male bonding session with my son. But it is a great event. It's a great honor to win. It's a great honor to participate in it. And you have great drivers like Felipe that come. He comes from Brazil. And you'll have people coming from Chile and from France and all over the world. And uh, Brazil, and it, uh, sort of cutting you off, but a big uh, big racing place. I mean, and I, I don't know why I wouldn't, I wouldn't normally think of uh, Brazil as uh, putting, cranking out the champions, but uh, they like the racing over there. He, he is, Felipe is one of the brightest new drivers we've had in oval racing in the States, and it's cool that he comes from Brazil. I mean, Brazil, that, that's, a, that's a different country. I went there when I was 18 for the first Grand Prix that I tried to qualify for, and it is, <laughs> they are different. And that, uh, that is uh, incredible. I mean, I, I would say the most glamorous of uh, any sport would have to be the Grand Prix stuff, like over in Europe or Brazil, mm -hmm. some place like that. I mean, in terms of the yachts and money, I mean, in terms of the average income of uh, the guys who get the pit passes, wouldn't you say that that uh, Formula One is uh, way up there? Well, say above, like let's say a tractor pull or maybe a <laughs> arena football, <laughs> or, or, or what was that motorcycle race from Finland you were talking about? Yeah, from, ice racing hey. from Helsinki, something like Good that. Stuff. And then barrel jumping. Yeah, well, you know what you got to do. I just thought about uh, after you win uh, the next Indy and they uh, shove that mic in your face, you do what athletes do to buy time, which is you thank Jesus Christ. Which is really they're not really that much into God, but they do it to kind of think. You know, <laughs> they try to get their breath back. It's a nice time saver. No one will ever question it. So it, it kind of gets you straightened out. I'm going to Disneyland. I'm going to Disneyland. Well, they they got to ask you to go, though. You don't uh, want to just announce you're going to Disneyland. You thank uh, your, yeah, say you love, send the love to the kids and thank Jesus Christ. And by the time you're done doing that, you'll get your bearings straight. Because uh, I always think about that with boxers, too. The guy just goes 12, 15 hard rounds of uh, Tyson smacking him about the head. And they put the mic in his face. And they go, in round two, he caught you. And you, your legs got a little wobbly. Did it hurt you? And it's like, <laughs> of course, you, you know, you've been, been whacked in the head with a two by four repeatedly for the last hour. Like you, you, you know exactly what he's talking about. Hey, speaking of boxing, Ali. Yeah, you're. Uh, is it Ali? Yes, Ali. Well, there you go. You're uh, 17. What's up? Yeah. Um, I have a question. Uh, I've I've watching. I've been watching you know, races like a couple times, but I don't watch it for very really long each time I do. Yeah. I've been wondering, um, can you guys like have like a spare car in the pit so like instead of instead of like when your tires run out or run out of gas or whatever, you could just like pull up to the pit or whatever, like switch cars real quick instead of waiting for everyone to like you know refuel your car. Very with, funny. With, <laughs> Yeah, you're a real genius there, Ali. <laughs> yeah, I guess it's going to take, like, it takes a very long time for us to change cars, and just to, to put the seat belts, on, seat belts on, it takes, like, five minutes. We change tires in 15 seconds, so. But you, you can bring a couple of cars with you, but you got to qualify one of them, and that's the car you got, right? Yeah, usually we take two cars. We have uh, the race car. And a spare car, and uh, whichever you qualify, and you have to race uh, with. So, but it usually, like the big teams, are um, they we usually have uh, two cars that you can like try different setups during the weekend. Right. And then, but then once you qualify with a car, then you have to race with. Right. And and uh, you're trying to set up the suspension or the or the right tire combination or something like that, and you dial it in, and that's the one you go with. And the the thing about 
seems the qualifications, I mean, how, first off, how many people, like for the Indy 500, how many people will try to qualify? Probably over the 50. There'll probably be 50, over 50, maybe 4, 55 qualifying attempts. I don't know, I don't know the number, but it's a very, it's a complicated procedure. You have pole weekend, which is the first weekend. And right. And then the people that don't make you, say you have the whole grid is filled. Right. And that's something called bump day. And that is the most excruciating, horrible thing for any driver to be involved in. Because you have 200,000 fans that are sitting there cheering for the guy who's going to get bumped off. And you go out and you do, put four laps together, the best average of four laps. And you are hanging it out. I mean, when you're trying to get into the race, you'll often drive harder than you will trying to qualify for pole. Right, right. Yeah, I could see that. And, and, uh, and, and it's just separated by, you know, hundreds of a second oftentimes, right? Even less. Even less. I mean, and, and I don't know what you know, What would be the next one? Thousands? Thousands? I, oh, I, I actually lost pole last year for I think it was four thousandths of a second or something. It's really? Not much? It's probably it's probably I don't know a third of a, a foot. Jesus Christ! Is there is there any other sport that where your life more depends on the other guy? It seems like you really have to. You're competing with everybody, but if somebody else is, you know, too aggressive or they're not as coordinated, they could. Or if they're an idiot. Yeah. Sort of thing. Yeah. <laughs> well. It, it, it seems like with like stock car racing, you can do some bumping and some shoving and stuff. But with open wheels, that that's going to be trouble, right? No, you, I mean, you guys can't do that. No, <laughs> no. no it, and it happens. Though. I mean, you make we, we we it it happens too often, and you can make a mistake. The worst thing that shouldn't happen and has happened in our past is the drivers will use their their cars as a, as like a, uh, trying to intimidate somebody, like to move them over the track. And we, you can't touch. You'll be sure of one thing. If you touch a car, I guarantee you, you're going to hit something. And going at those speeds, and when you start spinning, oh. you don't know what side's going to hit. I mean, but, it, but it's the most exhilarating racing I have ever been in. To see, to come out to Fontana and see uh, cars turning into the corners at above 220 miles an hour, three abreast, four inches between them, and if any of them so much as blink, you're going to have a problem. And they're both trying, all three are trying to out-dice each other. It's, it's, uh, it's crazy. It's it, cool. And when the, the thing about the open wheels is, uh, I mean, they, they, if they touch in any uh -huh. way, it just uh, sends things but sailing. Now, you, you guys have teams, right? And you can help the other guy. They can draft you. And yeah. you might not let somebody else do that or no. Is yeah, it, we it, do. You uh, know, but there's certain yeah. drivers. I I will I will draft with Felipe because I know he will in turn return the favor. The car that's in front is he like. He told a, me he wouldn't during the commercial. <laughs> I don't know. If you, <laughs> you were taking a leak. Yeah. He told me not to say anything. But <laughs> okay, I, I want that. Like I, I want that Red Bull back then. <laughs> <laughs> Let's save the baby. <laughs> all right, all right. <laughs> but it's it's a cool. It's a really great sport. It's really exciting. It's it's just neat. It's it's really cool to go out there. And race uh, I'd like to go to. Uh, I'm going out to a race this year. I'm going. To, uh, I'm going to the drag races on uh, Sunday. I'm trying. I'm trying to get to more, more motor related stuff. Yeah, you want to go? Yeah. All right, Rhea. Hey. You're 16. What's up? Yeah. Um, I have this stupid habit that whenever I like a guy and we start dating, um, the second it starts to get serious, I find something wrong with them. Yeah. And just focus on it, and then I break it off. And right. I was just wondering why I keep doing this with like every single guy. Well, where's your dad? Um, he's still in the same state, but I don't see him. Uh huh. When did he cut out? Uh, four years ago when my parents got divorced. And does does he does he keep in touch? Well, yeah, he does, but it's me that I don't want to see him. Why? Um, because he's bipolar. Oh, so he was kind of freaky growing up. Yeah, yeah. So he like scared you. Yeah, it's like totally my decision. Yeah, cause he, I mean, th this thing that you do is a real common thing. All women do it, you know, when they're younger. But, it, you, you know, usually as they get less, it, it goes away as they get less attractive. Yeah. You know, the years wear on, they get nicer about it. Stop nitpicking. But uh, when your dad leaves and your dad's weird like that and everything, usually means you're a little bit scared of uh, intimacy. You don't want to get caught up in a relationship. So you start looking for reasons not to be in a relationship. And then you end up getting out of the relationship. It's all about being sort of that... Fear of, of being connected. And once I break off with it, um, I end up, like, wanting them back, and I realize, like, how stupid I was. Yeah. But it's not stupid. And does what Adam's saying... Well, it's slightly dumb, yeah. ...make sense to you? Yeah. Yeah, because I understand it. It's just... Yeah. It's going to continue... the way I could, like, stop doing it. Yeah. Did you ever have any family therapy when your dad was going through his bipolar stuff? And Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, and you have access to... 
you're going through some stuff at this age especially well, it's really chaotic and it's really a lot of unexpected stuff when you start dating but when you have something like that thrown into it it can be very confusing and uh -huh. so that to avoid making this a pattern of what you're going to go through as you get older and you really want to you know when you're 16 you go out with a guy for a while and then you meet another guy that's fine but if you could go to a therapist have somebody you can talk to about what's going on as you date somebody because uh, it's not something that your intuition, there's nowhere in your brain that's going to tell you what to do and, and why this or that's okay. So y you could really benefit from somebody helping you through some of this stuff with a guy. If you have a normal dad and you have a good relationship, then there's some things that are sort of programmed into your brain uh, that make it easy for you to get close to somebody. And you don't have that. It's not your fault. Uh-huh. So yeah. if you could... Well, hey, uh, Rhea. Uh-huh. I mean, you know what you're doing, but that doesn't mean it's uh, easy to stop. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's going to be a going to be a process. You work on it. You're not supposed to be any good at 16 anyway. <laughs> I didn't know what I was doing at 16. Everyone's a horrible, you know. Everyone's horrible at dating at 16. But you're a smart person. You understand what's going on. And the important thing is that you see yourself doing it as you're doing it, and then you do it a little less each time, and eventually, you know, you get numb. And then you slip into a world, of, a dark world of masturbation, and you shut yourself off. Adam's world is you called. You watch ice, <laughs> ice racing from Helsinki yeah. all night, and you just sit around waiting for the Grim Reaper. All right? Okay. All right, good times. Uh -huh. okay. Good Warm. times. Thanks. Good times. Yeah. She'll be fine. Yeah. Uh -huh. Listen, you know, uh, Eddie, you have a daughter, right? Yeah. you got to be good to her. And so I, let have, me, I have a 13-year-old, uh, about to be 13-year-old daughter. Let me tell you. And I'm sitting here. Just thinking, what are my next three years going to be like? Oh, well, first off, I don't know. If, uh, three? How about five? You can f have them frozen now until we and, and, <laughs> and just suspend <laughs> and then, them. Yeah, 18. that that's not, that's not I, I think you can do it in Florida. I don't think it's a criminal offense. Oh, yeah. Hopefully that technology will be, will be in place so you when have, I have yeah, a 13-year-old yeah. daughter. But here's the thing. <laughs> I, I, this is the one thing I've learned uh, from this show, besides uh, all radio station coffee sucks. The, the other most important thing I've learned is uh, if you screw with your daughter, it will affect her. The, the relationship between the daughter and the, and the daddy is a big deal. Boys, they're more durable. They, they just are. They, uh, you know, their dad screws them over. He's an alcoholic. He leaves the family. They just end up taking their aggressions out on the football field or something like that, or they join the Coast Guard or something. It ends up working out. They usually kill a handful of people, but it but it works out. But the women, it, it uh, they're more delicately wired. They they really are. And uh, if the daddies, if you screw with your daughters, it will uh, come back to haunt you. All right, all right, yeah. After I, I remember. Uh, uh, being a child, being a lot simpler than it is now. I mean, these a lot of these questions they're asking. I, 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 it was. I mean, you're you're talking about probably. I'm what I'm 44, so there were, things are a bit different then. But yeah. I, I, I see my daughter as somebody who who knows a lot more than I ever did. Oh yeah, and they're capable of thinking it through a lot better than I ever was. It's not even did she knows more than you know now. Yeah, don't, I'm some things yeah. absolutely. Well, I mean, look at this. I mean, of course, I was watching. You know, I had three stations to watch on yeah. TV. I didn't know, you know, I mean, this thing about the internet and yeah. MTV and all this stuff. They, the heads are going to be packed full of sin by the time. But it I'm can also 13. be packed full of great things. Yeah. If, if, if you, if they understand what is right and what is wrong. I think a parent really, the main job my parents did is this is wrong. Right. That is right. And you're going to have to judge yourself because you can't have a parent there with you every two minutes saying do this, don't do that. But yeah. Adam has some confusion in those areas. And I don't think you can imagine your daughter calling in for advice from Adam Carolla. No. Oh, I. Now I, Drew's here. I yes. Admit that. All so right. To balance it out. All right. We're going to uh, take ourselves a uh, little break. When we come back, we'll speak to uh, Andy. He's a uh, big Eddie Cheever Jr. fan and uh, wants to know about uh, the F1 car, uh, Formula One car racing and all that after this. Everybody, it's Loveline. I'm Adam. That is uh, Dr. Bruce over there filling in for uh, Dr. Drew. Phone number 1 800 L O V E 191. Eddie Cheever Jr. is here and uh, Philippe Giafoni. 
both uh, IndyCar racers, and uh, the uh, season starts up, what is it, March? Yeah, just uh, real soon now. That's going to be in uh, Miami at the uh, Speedway, and then uh, it's about uh, about every week after that, right? All the way, uh, all the way through till uh, September. Of course, uh, the big, uh, big one, the Indy 500, coming up in uh, on May 26. What, what's the second biggest race you guys have on your schedule here? Um, in attendance, it's probably been Texas. Texas has been a, a strong one for us, but last year we had four. <laughs> hey, I, I got to meet this guy who does all this. Is it a person? Yeah. Is you, it, what is you, he? You met him. He's sitting right behind you. He's a squirrely kid with the bleached hair. Oh. Uh, Texas. Te Texas. Uh, we had a lot of sellouts last year. About Kansas was a great race. I mean, it's a great event. It's not just a race. It's an event that the whole city gets behind it. People have you know, oh, barbecues yeah. in the parking lots and families bring their kids and we're open for autograph sessions. And I'm, I've met more little kids that look up, look up at you and I can see they're dreaming. You know, one day I'm going to be, I'm going to be here. Monday I'm going to be driving. I think it's just cool. I like it because it's very open to family. So the good, Indy is an event. It's a social event. The whole city goes crazy. Yeah. And they, uh, they come out and they camp out, right? Yeah, and they bring cool. their Winnebago's and park in the infield and, and all that stuff. And then every I've been stopped for speeding in Indy probably five times, at least two in the last three years. And the cop will get out and he'll look at me and he'll he'll give me a what's the word you can use for your backside? That's uh, right here. you, you can't tokai. Talk, I can't use something. Tokai just doesn't sound. No, right. okay, doesn't, uh, asshole. Yeah, yeah, we'll get you big serious asshole. ass chewing. And then he'll tell you, okay, all right, Eddie, go on. You can go on. There you are. <laughs> so, I mean, India is just a marvelous place. I love it. I, I live there part of the year. It's a great event. And there's just so much history. It's just, it's just so, it's just neat. Yeah, and uh, they, uh, they, you know what I like? I like that stripe of brick they have uh, going across the old uh, And you can yard. feel it. You, you can oh, feel yeah. it. I mean, you, you it's, a, it's like a large, uh, not like a shutter, but you can feel it going over there. Can you imagine doing 500 miles? Was it 87 years ago? I think we've had 87, 500 and these guys had to have spare drivers. They had to get uh, get out of the car, and somebody would relieve them a little bit and go out again. I, I don't know how many hours it would take with these cars that were chain driven. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah, they're just oh my god, yeah, yeah. hard men. There's pictures of these guys, and it's unreal after the race. Yeah, the faces are black. Oh, and, black and, uh, <laughs> all right, let's uh, talk to uh, big uh, Eddie Cheever fan uh, Andy. Hey, what's up, you guys? Hey, you're 22. What's up? Um, I'm a big Eddie Cheever fan. Um, I've seen you race in uh, Phoenix. You're a hell of a wheelman. Okay. And um, but recently I've gotten way into the F1. I don't know why it's just I guess so uh, high tech and glamorous. And I've gone to a few GPs. Um, and I'm starting to uh, I have a good job. I'm starting to make some money. But I would drop it all just for the chance to uh, join the F1 circus and get going with them. Do you know any, Do you know any way to get started? I, I agree with you. And I'll, I'll tell you the truth. The main reason why I started racing, why I was attracted to it, was A, the cars, and B, the women. Uh, oh, when I was 13 years old, uh, the Grand Prix race car drivers had the prettiest women. They traveled to all the really cool places, and they got to drive these really fast cars. And, and, and that is not a lie. Um, so it, any, I was lucky to drive in it, but it is, it is really interesting, and there's a thousand and one ways you can do that. You can be involved in marketing. You can be involved in the technical side of the company. There's... Well, what do you want to do, Andy? Well, um, I'm still in school, and uh, How I was old are wondering you? if maybe like a journalism degree or something like that would help. 22. I, um, I mean, I'm probably too old to start, you know, thinking about uh, ever driving for F1, but there's so many jobs probably in the whole circus. I don't know where uh, I would even begin, though. Well, what, what about uh, hooking up with some of the big sponsors or something like that? Uh... Yeah, I guess I could do that. Um, well, what do you want Eddie to do? Uh, make a phone call? Yeah, I was hoping get, he'd somewhat, you know, you. talk to somebody to really get me in. Yeah, he could he'd probably get you about third or fourth on the grid, but I don't think he can get you pull just from the phone call. I mean, you're going to have to turn a few laps. He doesn't have that much pull. Um, too bad there's not an American F1 team. There, there, will, there will be. Yeah, there is an yeah. American a, a Formula 1 With team. Jaguar? Right? Jaguar. Jaguar, but it's it's kind of an it's very tongue in cheek. I mean, tongue in cheek. Can I get a job at their wind tunnel? Isn't it in California? Yeah, one of them is, I think, but they're also using one in England. I mean, Formula One is a multi-billion-dollar business. They have interests all over the world. I think it it would be a it's a 
there are a lot, it's a circus. There's a lot of people that travel all over all these Grand Prix. You start in one part of the world, you end up in another. One of the U.S. Grand Prix, with the U.S. Grand Prix is now being held in Indianapolis. So there's a there's a million and one ways to do it. If you wanted to become a Grand Prix driver, you're talking to the wrong guy because I really couldn't tell you how to do that. And that's where um, I spent most of my time. But there's and you, you drove for a Ferrari most of that time? I tested for Ferrari when I was uh, 18. I raced for Tyrrell, Renault, Alpha. And and, it, and when I was doing it, it really wasn't followed a lot in the States. It was a very European sport, and and, uh, and it was great. I had a, a great time representing America, and the U.S. Grand Prix for me were, were uh, a lot of fun. But it, it is uh, very glamorous. It's very hard technically. It's uh, ruthless. I mean, you so much as blink. You're, uh, you're out of a drive and not doing something, and you can never give an inch to another race car driver. And racing on ovals is different than racing on a Grand Prix. That you're, you're always tethered to the car that you're driving in motorsports. But in Formula One, if you start off the season with a car that isn't good, that's you're screwed. it. You're screwed. For the rest of the season, you'll be, you'll be happy if you end up fourth or fifth in a race. And it, it just wears on you after a while. All right. What's Let's, the uh, race you're always trying to get into? You complain they never let you drive. The Helsinki. Uh, no, no, no. No, 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 no I'm, I'm trying the uh, Toyota Grand Prix right, of right, uh, right. Long Beach. Yeah, yeah. Right. I'm working on that right. this year, this year again. All right, we'll uh, take ourselves a uh, little break. We'll be back, uh, talk a little more uh, indie driving and uh, helping the kids after this. <laughs> yep, there we go. More Love Line. Eddie Cheever Jr. is here, along with uh, Philippe Giafoni, both uh, racing Indy cars for a living. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, what a life. What a life. Uh, just sitting here uh, talking cars uh, with the guys. Yeah, I always find that uh, race car drivers seem to drive the uh, least glamorous uh, street cars. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, I guess they don't have to compensate yeah. like uh, rock star drivers or uh, radio show hosts or anything like that. But <laughs> race car drive, you know, like uh, Tommy Lee came over here from uh, Motley Crue about uh, three years ago, and his everyday driver is a very modified uh, Ferrari Testarossa that uh, he let me take for a little spin around the block. And I think they, uh, I think they overcompensate yeah. the race car drivers. These guys probably have a lot more fun in their cars than the mm. track. Yeah, don't need to. Still seems like you should have a slightly cooler car. I think. Um, what could be cooler than my Indy car? I mean, what? You should tell me one car that's the same as what I, it has. Three thousand pounds of downforce. It goes two hundred and forty miles an hour. It's got a seven horsepower engine. A track. <laughs> if I want it, I got room for it. I mean, only. I, what well, can be better? That's the problem. Why? Why? Where's the excitement? I mean, I want to sit in a car and be comfortable and turn the music up and put the seat back. How much do those uh, Indy cars weigh these days? A couple thousand pounds? I think it's a thousand seven hundred. Oh, really? That's that's yeah. light. Carbon fiber, highest technology you can think. It absorbs a lot of impact. Jesus, and and they have uh, you guys have like sort of the um, crash seat too now, right? Where you're mm -hmm. sitting in that bucket that's. Uh, yeah got some protective qualities it's to better it. than that it's a special imagine sitting in a, a bag of uh, little beads yeah yeah and, yeah. and, they, yeah. and that's not warm it's oh, just, so okay. they, they put you in your seat this little seat this thing of beads right fills around the shape of your body and it absorbs all this energy if you have an accident so it's disposable you have an accident when you have an accident you have to try to destroy the car right the seat has got to break Right, the you, monocoque has got to fall off. Even if it means jump, taking a bat to it, yeah, whatever. You but it, you you have to get rid of all that energy. So our cars are built for that. I mean, you, you, well, a car that's come done, ready to go, ready to race, ready to win, is going to cost you probably close to about half a million dollars with computers, engines, frames, tires. Yeah, and you got to have uh, extra everything. And yeah. and what do you uh, like? Uh, you do? Does the engine get torn down and rebuilt uh, after every miles. race? Every six hundred miles is taken apart. But now, what if you got it? So obviously, after the Indy 500, it's uh, coming apart. But if you have a race that's 250 miles, you'll let it let it if it checks out. Go oh. a couple races with it. No, you practice a little bit, and then you change the engine. You oh, I you think it's the same engine for two races. Right, and then they just tear just uh, new bearings and new rings and uh, put it back, or the new pistons and everything. Thirty grand. Jesus. All right. Let's heal some babies. All right. That's why they got to have sponsors. <laughs> Jacob? Hello? You're uh, 16? Yeah. What's up? 
I had a question for uh, Philippe and Edward. I was wondering, uh, like, nowadays you guys are pulling like 240 miles per hour. I was wondering, like, in 50 years, how fast do you think race cars are going to go? 243, 240. 240. I think that we're actually slowing down these, these speeds now nowadays. I think it's uh, very easy to make the car to go fast. That's why the, the rules uh, are there, you know, just to, to kind of... Uh, protect a little bit more the drivers and uh, and be a little safer so what they i think the speed is going to be a little uh, pretty close from what we have today uh, basically what they're going to do uh, nowadays we use like a three liter and a half you know the engines uh -huh. so then it's uh, uh, the engineers and all the the mechanics you know the the factories they try to uh, to improve and and make something to go faster and faster so I think this is good for uh, technology you know because it's gonna get uh, faster and then they're gonna go okay now it's a uh, three liter and then 2.5 and that makes uh, everybody thinks better and, and improve the, the street cars in the future as well right so if it was just a sort of unlimited cylinders or unlimited displacement you wouldn't have to be that smart to get more horsepower. You just add some more cylinders or some more displacement. But uh -huh. now they're figuring out ways. I mean, displacement meaning making the engine bigger, you idiots. <laughs> <laughs> but uh -huh. now what they're doing is they have to figure out a way to squeeze more horsepower out of, out of smaller engines, which is why, for instance, you can buy, you know, street cars that are two liters with 200 horsepower now. And, you know, 100, 100 ponies a liter is, uh, my, you know, naturally aspirated. No turbo, no supercharger. That's pretty good, and that's probably another benefit of racing. Efficiency. Efficiency. We're always working for efficiency. The people that make the rules, they try to make the rules in such a manner so that you won't go over certain speed limits and it will remain safe. The problem is they're not as smart as the ones that are trying to beat them. Right. So when they give us a set of rules, I, I have a whole group of engineers, and it's more people than they have on their own board where they try to decide the rules but it's not just me it's felipe's team and it's penske's and we're all doing everything we can to get as much speed out of these cars as we can and every now and again they got to say look we got to go from a four liter to a 3.5 liter to a three liter and so on and so forth but it's about competition it's not it's not a drag race i mean like in baseball they could use aluminum bats and uh, the ball would travel 30 feet further on a home run but they don't have that you know what I mean? There's, there's they might not have it with bats, but those baseball players sure are getting big. If you were to check them out 20 years ago, they're a lot bigger now than they were then. That's because they're trying to do everything they can to get the most within out of the what rules. They, within the rules, right? And the rules are, are there to make uh, make it uh, competitive and, and it's and exciting. Uh, and right, right. Unlike uh, something like, for instance, I was talking about going out to the drag races uh, this week. You know, that's just one of those. But that's different. Crazy things. I've never yeah, been to, to one. Is it's, it pretty neat? It's scary. <laughs> yeah, it really is. Well, I'll tell you one, I'll tell you one thing they're going to do is, uh, I know this drag racing. I know it just sounds like I'm, I'm, I'm getting deeper and deeper into the white trash here with the, <laughs> uh, you know, going to the super cross races and stuff. But I'll, I'll, I'll go and check out anything that I will, uh, I don't care if it's mud wrestling or drag racing. If it's impressive, it's impressive. <laughs> the dragsters, here's the thing that's crazy about the dragsters. Uh, and, and uh, the dragsters, first off, they can't, they don't know how many horsepower they have because there's no dyno <laughs> for an engine that just blows up, basically. But, uh, you know, they got like uh, 20,000 horsepower or something like a completely radically insane. And they, it doesn't sound like an engine. It sounds like an explosion. And the pits are open. You can walk up and down the pits, and these things just burn nitro. And they have them up on these uh, jack stands, and they fire these uh, blown, you know, hemi big block engines up that are running right. off uh, all nitro. And it just sounds like explosions going off, and they're spitting out nitro. I mean, you can't see. Your eyes are burning. These things are spinning around. Kids are trying to eat snow cones and walk around. One of those dragsters is coming off the jack stands and going right through a, a whole, whole group of kids, and uh, that'll be the end of that. So my feeling is... is I, here's what I try to do in life, and I think you should, too. <laughs> you should look for the stuff that's going to be shut down in a few years. And, and you know, there was all, it, this, is how, this is how everything eventually goes. 
Now, I went to the Super Bowl this year. It took me two hours in line. They searched every cavity I had to walk through. You know, the metal detectors. <laughs> the guy, they had me vomit into a bucket to make sure I wasn't <laughs> smuggling any contraband in. And I was sit, sitting next, standing next to the guy in line, and I was saying, imagine what the Super Bowl was like in 1972. I mean, you could have walked in with a briefcase full of plastic explosives and a bazooka and no one would have, you know, and a pony keg, and no one would have even slowed you down. you got to look for those things that exist now that someone's going to put an end to soon. For me, one of those things is drag racing. I, I respect those guys. They are, they are nuts. Yeah. I don't know how they do it. Well, they're nuts. That's how they do it. Over there, I, I was actually on an interview the day with with Force, and he's something else. I mean, he, these guys they get in these cars and they can't see, they can't breathe, they explode every now and again, and they're going. Yeah. I mean, they're it's, they're they're. I think the record on a motorcycle is two hundred and forty three miles an hour. Can you imagine how much skin you would go off on your would just burn off on your body if you hit the ground going two hundred and thirty miles an hour? Yeah, and the guys in the the funny cars and dragsters are doing like three twenty five, three thirty. It's, it's scary just sitting there. there. That's yeah, it, it it does. It it sounds like an explosion going off. It's not. It doesn't sound like a, a souped up engine. It just sounds like someone threw a grenade. Uh, first time you go, you're like, is this the way it's supposed to be? Mm. Thinks the whole thing's going to blow. That's why you got to get drunk. You have to numb yourself with booze. Otherwise, it's too much to process. That's what I do. I start right with the booze. I go right for the hospitality hut. Kayla? Yeah? You're 15? Yeah. What's up? Um, I wanted to know if they allow girls into drag racing. Yeah, they're called... No! They're called pit girls. They run around in go-go boots, and they hand out uh, skull, you know, chewing tobacco. It's great. There's room <laughs> for everybody. What, you mean you want to you wanna drag race? Yeah. Well, there's Shirley Cha-Cha Muldowney. <laughs> I mean, she, she's been, uh, been around or was around 30 years ago. W women have become very successful in motorsports. In in the IRL there's a young woman called Sarah Fisher who is very fast, uh, incredibly popular with the fans, very committed to what she's doing and I think I think they there's just you know the world is changing. Before you would think that girls would sit home and play with dolls. I mean now that just isn't the case. Sarah is one hell of a race car driver. And they're good. They're they're uh, well. First off, a lot of the reasons the teams like them is because their insurance is lower. <laughs> so we all know women women do get a break, even even on the circuit. But hey, Kayla, yeah, you want you want a drag race? Yeah. And why? Well, because my sister's boyfriend, he's into it, and I go to most of all of his races, and I really like it. It's just fun. Well, you know they they have those drag racing schools. You can go there, get a feel for it. Yeah. Why don't you do that? I mean, if yeah. you're interested in it. I'll look into it. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Bye. Yeah. The, the, the women do fine with that because their reaction time is fine and they're a little bit lighter and their, their endurance is probably a little better than guys sometimes. You don't need endurance in drag racing. It's no, not drag seconds. racing, but I mean like... Uh, you need to be certifiably indie. crazy, I think. And then if you can do that, if you're willing to sit in a, over a keg of nitro and just aim this thing down the uh, straightaway, then... Oh, my God. <laughs> you know, I love this show because I end up talking about drag racing for two hours. But the craziest, you go to the drag racing museum over there in uh, Pomona and you see those cars that were run in the 50s and the 60s. They're sitting right on top of the pumpkin there. They got the differentials like between their legs. I mean, when they used to have the engine in front on the rails... You, you do the math. The engine is in front of you. The drive shaft's three feet long, and the differential is uh, mean, meaning the axle for all uh, the lay people. The rear axle is right between your legs. And they're not made. They're not designed to take. Would you say twenty thousand horsepower? So every now and again, something breaks in it. Yeah, yeah that's like uh, sitting on a grenade. So it's bad times. <laughs> that drag racing. <laughs> AJ. Hello. Hey, you're seventeen. What's up? Hey, I was just wondering, uh, Eddie, uh, what happened to all the short track racers that would race in the Indy 500? Where are the old A.J. Foyts and Mario Andretti's Pernilla Jones? They win the Indy 500 next week, they'd show up at a quarter-mile dirt track. Where, what happened to all those guys? You know, that's a, that's a really good question. And um, I think that really is the main reason why the Indy Racing League was created in the beginning. Um, a lot of those drivers that came from short tracks were, like you said, the ones that became the Indianapolis 500 champions and heroes of American racing. And I think with the event of kart 
uh, going on road racing, it took the emphasis off those short tracks. Short tracks are really cool. You go to a short track, you see a mom and a dad, and they've got this 16-year-old kid that has a great passion for racing, and they, they, they work on the car together, they race it, this kid goes out there and kicks everybody's butt, and, and all of a sudden he would be a very, he would have the opportunity and the talent um, to race, but he couldn't go any higher because it wasn't possible. There was, there was this big bridge that was missing from short tracks to the Indianapolis 500. Then you created the Indy 500, not the Indy 500, the IRL, and along comes a driver like Tony Stewart. I mean, I met Tony Stewart, who, who now has become a, one of the NASCAR's best. I was, I was at a race in Indianapolis, and um, they told me to look at this kid. They said he's really good, very brave. And he was very good and very brave. And this, I went and talked to him, and there, he was all dirty, and he had mud on his hands, but he had a look in his eye like he wanted to go kick everybody's butt. No matter what he sat in, he didn't care. But Ish. there was no way for him to go into the 500. Then he did. Came in, won the IRL's championship, then went on race to NASCAR. But uh, that's it, a really good question. Is short track uh, always dirt, or does it does it not have? To, it can be, be dirt. Anything. It can be pavement. It's you're racing midget, silver crown, and these are cars that have been around forever. And it's a really good series. And there's a whole mountain of race car drivers that compete there. But what is really what's really neat about it is that it is American racing. I mean, this is you don't get any more American than that. It's like football. But there was no bridge. The bridge was cut off from those short tracks to the Indy 500. Now it's in place again. And that really is the main reason why the IRL was created, to give opportunity to people like this. Well, thanks huh? there, uh, AJ. Uh, hey, thanks. AJ. Were you named after AJ Foyt? Um, no, not really, but he's one of my heroes. Hey, well, why don't you just go ahead and say you were. Okay, yeah, his name after AJ Foyt. <laughs> right, well, it be a little more organic. I'll try it one more time. Were you named after AJ Foyt? Yep. All righty. But I'd want to meet him first before I'd say that. I, I drove from. You might want to actually spend a few minutes with him before you say that. Pain in the ass. <laughs> the most opinionated man I've ever met. But oh, if, really? If he wasn't there, you would have to invent him because he is quite unique. Oh, boy. Who knew he was a uh, big a-hole? I didn't say that. I, didn't, I did not say that. <laughs> that's, what, that's what I heard. Mandy? Mandy? Hey, what's up? Hey, you're 17. What's up? Well, I've been having a hard time with my boyfriend lately. I've known him for eight and a half years, and we've been going out for about mm, a year and a half. And all of a sudden, every time I call his house, his friends answer the phone. They're like, hey, what's up, and everything. He's not home. I'm like, where did he go? He went to his other friend's house. So I'm assuming that he's purposely avoiding me for some odd reason. Yeah. You've known him for eight years? Yeah, I met him um, when I was like nine and a half. I was little back then, and I'm surprised we've known each other that long. How old is he? He just turned 19. Mm. And mm. I'll be 18 this July. All right. You guys have been going out for a year or so? Yeah, and all of a sudden, he's starting to turn me down and, like, just give me the cold shoulder. And I keep asking him. It's like, hey, what's wrong with you? He's like, I'm mad at you. And he, he told me he was jealous because I was talking to one of my old friends and stuff. And mm -hmm. he thinks that my friend's going to take me away from him, so now he's giving me the cold shoulder. Well, how long has he been giving you the cold shoulder? About two months now, and he just he won't hmm. let two, me talk two, to him. Hold on, two months? <laughs> hey, he broke up with you yeah. two months ago. That ain't cold shoulder. That's um, yeah. that's um, frozen nut? I, I don't know what that is. Were you planning on marrying this guy, or what? Uh, he'd ask me every now and then. I'd say, you know what? No, I'm, st I'm still going through school and stuff, and I mean, yeah. I've got my last year of school yeah. to finish. And I, I think you guys broke up. Yeah. He well, just didn't tell you. Well, he thinks that I'm trying to break up with him and stuff, and he thinks that I'm trying to get rid of him. And Well, have you, have you guys gone out on a date in two months? Um, yeah, we've, like, hung out and, you know, went and saw a movie and stuff. And when, When's the last time you hung out with him? Um, last Wednesday. So it's been, uh, Jesus Christ! I you know I was in New Orleans for five days. So seven I don't know days what, ago. What month it is? Mm -hmm. Go seven Pats! Day, seven days ago. Oh, Jesus yeah. Christ! I I gotta detox myself. Um. All right. And and, and did you guys do you, do you sleep with the guy? No. I live in Buena Park. He lives in Santa Ana, and so like I have to take the public bus to go see him. Uh huh. So you're not sexually active with him? Oh, hell no. All right, for, for those of you who are listening, Buena Park and Santa Ana are 
I don't know, 25 miles? Of, I don't know. They're just crap holes, both of them, right? You should move almost immediately. Don't don't date anyone from that part of the woods, even if you uh, live there. So one of the luxuries about being 17 is you get to go out with somebody, and then when you get tired of them, move on to somebody else. You're not hooked to the guy. And when a guy is 19, they're, they change a lot from 17, 18 to 19, as you will. So it's a wonderful thing you get to go out with somebody else. It sounds like your relationships run its course. And, Fine. And you guys can't. Maybe you should just get together and talk about that. I don't know what you talked well, about last can't, Wednesday. She but... can't find the guy, so yeah. how are they going to do that? Just... Have your attorney <laughs> <laughs> arrange a meeting. Uh, listen, this is over with, Mandy. Right. It's, that's fine. This is this is the way it's supposed to go. Yeah, and my mom and some of my friends are like, just kick him to the curb, get rid of him. So. Yeah, yeah. There's so, uh, all right. Break up with him. Don't exert that much energy, but don't do that thing I've done uh, many times when. Uh, you know, the guy breaks up with the chick, and you're like, I didn't want to say anything, but that fat whore, thank God you cut her loose. I mean, she was a pain in the ass, the ass the size of Texas. And then you talk to him three weeks later, it's like, yeah, me and Diane got back together. And we're married. Oh, we're getting married. We're getting married, week. and you're like, oh, uh, oh, that fat whore. I was talking about someone. That other one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's important to really make sure people are broken up before you start talking smack about the person, because... There's all those things you want to say while they're together and you never do, and then they break up and it all comes spilling out over a few beers, and they inevitably get back together, at least for some period of time, and then you look like a major a-hole. So uh, save all that stuff for at least six months after they've broken up. But every relationship when you're 16 or 17 goes on a year longer than it should. Right. And people just hold on and hold on, and there's this thing where we've invested three years. I'm not going to give it up even if it's not working out. Mm. Well, what kind of retarded thinking is that? You got something that's not working. I mean, I always say, apply that to a job. You have a bad job. We don't get along with the boss. You've been there for three years. You don't want to be there for four years. Well, what if it's your first job, though? And when you're a kid, that's your first love affair. That's the first lesson you've had, and you're learning from it. So you don't know what is coming later. That's right. That's right. Eddie is uh, absolutely right. Are we talking about work, though, now? Or are we still, no, we're talking I'm about sorry. relationships. You, you, were, you, you were comparing. <laughs> no, you're thing. right. Don't, I got confused. You, don't, you right. don't know what's going to come later. That's the most important thing in, in your life. I, mean, I was going to be like, well, are there, you know, do you get paid OT or is there 401K? <laughs> yes. You're, and this, this analogy. I was making officially an analogy. Thank you. you and, get, and you're right. Don't get too abstract here. No, but here's <laughs> concrete here, thinking is here, here, here's the the deal too. Yeah, you don't and when you've had a few relationships, you can then sniff out the ones that are gone gone south and get out of them at the four month mark. My twelve year old, my twelve almost thirteen year old daughter called me the other day saying she was angry. I couldn't tell what the problem was. She said I've I've uh, broken up with my boyfriend. I had no idea that there was a boyfriend. I don't even know what the what the concept of a boyfriend she's talking about. And as she was explaining to me, I was having a hard time not laughing, which would have been the hardest, the, the most stupid thing I could have ever done. So we talked through all this. This is the first time, and she's telling me that she knows she was on the school bus, and he talked with her friend, and there are some. I, I, I mean, it was a very convoluted thing, but the lesson that I think I learned from that is at that moment, that was the most important thing in her life because she was starting a whole brand new concept of something that she's seen adults and her parents and her friends and older friends do. So they build, I, I, at least I, I think my daughter is building like layer on top of layer every day of how to react with the opposite gender. Now, I'm 44 years old. And I have no idea how to do it. Well, it's, <laughs> it's, it, but you're, you're smart in that it's important not to laugh uh, at your daughter when she's telling you her, uh, her, uh, her story. No, I, 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 I was laughing because it didn't yeah. seem that serious to me. Like, no. why, why are you so, honey, why are you so upset about this? I, well, who cares? So what? But it probably lasted three days, but. No, but, no. but it's know, so important for her to have you to talk, to have a dad right. to be able to bounce that off of his... Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, and I know my girlfriend tells me stories about work. I start laughing. That's the other reason. You can't laugh at that <laughs> one. You know, uh, Sharon McCluskey? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, she comes in like she's the queen of Sheba. Uh, she's wearing the same sweater I told her I was going to wear. Uh, it, it, it's important just to pull the phone away because otherwise you start laughing in the middle of it. And then, uh, that big, no. Then, no. There's, uh, yeah. then you start working in the uh, I got real problems line, and uh, that's when they go off. Bruce, you don't do You don't even talk to your wife, do you? Well, I'm a sensitive guy. You know? Yeah, I know. Yeah. Not like you. That's called a puss. <laughs> I've had anal sex and oh. I passed out. A <laughs> Bruce, we haven't gone to break yet. Uh, and in racing, we have different words. We, it's, even, it's even more aggressive than that. Oh, really? <laughs>
What's that? Yeah. I can't. Well, I got no, in trouble for saying hey, shifting. And you want me to say that? Anderson's there with his finger on the seven second delay. All right. Whatever. Well, you tell us. Tell us during so, the okay. break. All right. We're going to uh, take another break. When we come back, we'll uh, think. Uh, we'll talk to uh, Diana. She thinks her family's insane. Wants to know if it's okay to cut off uh, all ties with them after no this. Problem. Hey, everybody! It's Loveline. Uh, Madam, that's Dr. Bruce. Dr. Bruce is uh, filling in for Dr. Drew tonight. Dr. Drew is, uh, I don't know where, doing I don't know what, but uh, we don't care about it. Painful erection that will not go away. <laughs> but he still feel like he's with us in a way. Eddie Cheever Jr. is uh, here along with uh, Philippe Giafoni. Both uh, great uh, indie drivers, and uh, they're involved with the... Uh, IRL series, which is the uh, Indy Racing League, and that starts up uh, March in uh, Miami, beginning of March, and goes uh, all the way through uh, September 15th, and uh, we were just talking about going out to uh, on the 24th, that's the uh, California Speedway one, yes, I would uh, I would love to go to that, I, uh, I really, uh, I really enjoy those, uh, those events, and uh, I, I, I think, uh, I think a lot of people do, because uh, there seems... I don't know what the average attendance is at those uh, races, but it seems to be well over a hundred uh, thousand people. A lot of people, and it's uh, there's the good thing about seeing an oval is that you can see the cars the whole way around the track. And there's a lot of stuff going on. There'll be battles in the front, battles in the back. And they uh, they it's pretty busy. They uh, yeah, it's a it's an event. And uh, Steph, I, I went out there to do a uh, I, I think it was California Speedway uh, last year. Do a little uh, bit with uh, NASCAR. And uh, those are some fans. Mm. Oh yeah, yeah. Even even uh, even even too white trashy for me, I must say. <laughs> the infield, the uh, guys camped out in the Winnebagos. There, they've been there for actually since the last year. They never leave. <laughs> they, they drink a little too much. Fall off the top. <laughs> they put the Winnebago up on uh, up on blocks. They get the uh, they take the uh, twelve pack container and they uh, take a piece of charcoal. They take a brick cat and they write, uh, "Show us your boobs." <laughs> and they sit up there uh, just getting stewed uh, all day long. And that's a bad thing? No, and it's really, it's it's not a bad thing. But when they uh, then uh, recognize you from basic cable <laughs> after their 15th beer and start screaming at you and chasing you on their uh, three-wheeled <laughs> a- ATCs, it, it gets a little hairy. And, and us, us, us Yankees, you know, we've seen uh, deliverance. Oh. And we're, we're quite, quite frankly, we're frightened by uh, Southern folk. All right, let's talk to uh, Diana. Is thirty-two, Diana. Diana. Oh, oh, she's been on hold for one hundred and three yeah, minutes. Well. Jesus Christ, Diana. Wake All right. Up. Well, listen. Let me let me answer your question. You think your family's nuts? You want to know if it's okay to cut them off? I say yes. Let's talk to. Uh, I'll put her back on hold. Maybe she'll wake up. Dan. Yes. You're thirty-one. Yes. What's up? Hey, Adam. The long, longtime fan and. Uh, Eddie and Philippe, longtime fan as well. Uh, my question is: is um, <clears throat> I was wondering what your take is on the uh, the Cart and the IRL getting back together again, because it just seems like these days, instead of like the talks, they, they're always talking, but uh, it just seems now that the the Cart teams are kind of migrating over to IRL. What's Cart stand for? Championship Auto Racing Teams. All right, didn't know that. Well, what about it? They, these guys don't like each other, right? The the cart and the IRL, they're like no. the Hatfields and the McCoys, right? <laughs> no, it, it. Oh, this is. I'm getting so tired of answering this, but I'm. I'm thank you for the question, and I will do my best to answer it in the least political and unbiased manner that I'm capable of. <laughs> thank you. It just seems like the media just doesn't like. Well, they take sides all the time. <laughs> that, that, that is true. There, there was a definite, and I'll be as brief as I can, there's a definite difference in philosophy as to how motor racing should be run between CART and the Indy Racing League. I race in the Indy Racing League, so I'm better at explaining their point of view than I am CART's point of view. Mm-hmm. Um, CART is eclectic. They do a little bit of this and a little bit of that, but they're not experts in anything. They try to compete in too many different fields. They have a great race here in Long Beach, which I, I'm, I'm very jealous of. I think it's one of the funnest events that I've ever participated in as a racing driver. But then they go in other places, and they will race, and, and, and it just doesn't really make sense. And they, I, I believe that over time, uh, the public 
became very confused with what they they stood for. The IRL, on the other hand, races on American oval tracks. It's mm -hmm. uh, they've copied a lot of what NASCAR has done. Uh, we race on a lot of NASCAR's events uh, at their race tracks, and it's a lot easier for the public to embrace it and to understand it. Another difference in this philosophy is is that we have equal access to technology. What I mean by that is you can't have somebody like, just I'll choose a name, and I have a lot of respect for Team Penske come in and outspend people by 10 times and win every race just because they have a better financial backing. So you can't go do that. I can go buy the same equipment that Penske can, whereas in CART that was impossible to do. So right. the races are a lot tighter. The competition is a lot more severe. And uh, CART is a public company. It's run by a board, and it's almost like having the lunatics control the asylum. And they've made a lot of mistakes, and uh, I think they put dri their drivers in jeopardy. They made a lot of irresponsible um, decisions over time. And they went to Texas, for example, all the race without testing and checking, and the race car drivers are going too fast. And they had to quit because they had vertigo. Right. They oh, really? So, I mean, I don't know who. They don't have any more feet to shoot off, so now all of the car teams are coming over to the IRL because it makes good business sense. We have growing public, we race in great tracks, and, and there's a lot of young drivers that are coming up through. So I'm not trying to sound political, but I believe that good business in the end uh, made the decision for everybody. When a team like Penske comes to the IRL, it's because it makes business sense. He's not a politician, he's a businessman. What is, uh, changing gears here slightly, what, what is your favorite year of uh, IndyCar. Like for me, I, I think about those ones from the uh, like early 70s, uh, late 60s. You know, I agree. Those A.J. Foyt cars and stuff. He's I, American. Yeah, they're really, uh, really cool looking ones. Well, I don't know who, was it A.J. Foyt had the blue one with the thunderbolts on it? Or, no, it was uh, an Unser. Oh, that was Unser. That, that's answer. right. Yeah, that, that was the best. You know, I don't like I don't like the I don't like the uh, Grand Prix cars now because uh, they got the scoop on the bottom of the nose. Looks lame. <laughs> so to me, it's all about what the car looks like. I don't like that funky shark nose there with the scoop down on the down on the ground. I are like you the, that I like picky with your women? I mean, you have yeah. certain things that have to be there. Yeah. Are, are, are you that picky? <laughs> yes, I am. Yes, it's all about what the cars look like. So, it's huh? a cart-related question if you want to take that. No, no, screw those carters. Okay. <clears throat> I want to wait. Who do you got here? We'll get to them. But uh, well, this is, they've been Danny? on seventy-four minutes. Yeah. All right, Danny. Hey, Adam. How's it going? Good. What's up? Um, well, you know, I, actually, I just wanted to say that hi to Dr. Bruce, uh, yeah. Felipe, and uh, Eddie. You know, so nobody's saying hi, so I want to say hi. Uh, well, my problem is, actually, I don't know if it's a, if it's a problem or not. Though. Well, um, well, I'm 19, um, and let's say I'm having sex with my girlfriend, and after I finish uh, doing, you know, my thing, um, I, I actually do it protected you know, it's the right way to do it. And uh, when I'm actually finished, I just feel completely disgusted with her. And, I mean, she's gorgeous. She's a great person. But I just feel like, I mean, I look at her, I'm like, wow, what am I doing with her? Just for that split second. And, you know, I, I want to call you guys and find out maybe you have some sort of diagnosis for my problem. Well, why aren't you uh, eating at this point? What are you doing still in the room? I mean, you What's should that? immediately be in front of the refrigerator. You should you should not be in the same room with her after you're done. Uh, you understand? That's where the problem right, is. Right, right. I, I understand what you're talking about, but um, I mean, is this a? Yeah. I mean, is this normal? I mean, well, you're 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 saying. disgusted with her. Like, why would she have sex with someone like you? Or what? <laughs> what is your angle there? More like, I why would I have sex with her or just anybody else? Just women alone just disgust me. Just for that split. You know, five, ten. Uh, You're gay, minutes. right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm not gay. Well, I, you know, I, I, I hate to uh, again work the experience thing, but th you have a lot of feelings when you're younger about sex that seem to go away as you get uh, older. Do you, do you know what I mean? And it's just right. sort of it's through repetition. Your your mind is racing, or you have negative thoughts, or you have crazy you know lustful thoughts or all, all everything just gets turned down a couple of notches and uh i you know you're not uh i mean you're back in a few seconds it's just it's just a couple of seconds it takes me yeah but it doesn't take very long you know it just takes just right after the climax for about you know 10 to 15 seconds yeah all right well you there's nothing you're not going to stab her or anything are you no you just, definitely not definitely not all right well then just don't say anything stupid Right. And you'll be fine. 
Okay. I don't know what what goes on in your what goes on in a brain after that when during an orgasm in a male. I get hungry. The, you know, I wouldn't use the word disgust in anywhere near that experience. I don't. It but sounds like he's got sleepy. some real yeah. sleepy. Yeah. Why Why are you talking afterwards, anyways? Yeah, that, that's what I'm saying. You should you should be standing in front of the refrigerator. Uh, it sounds like he's got some real ambivalent feelings about something in the relationship. I'd wonder that he's not a little mm-hmm. bit confused about whether he should be in the relationship Oops. at some level. How long have you been going out with this gal? I just, I just hung up on somebody. But go ahead. For about a year. A year and you yeah. Know, I've I've actually confronted her about it and I've sure. heard that you know what I feel and you know I've I was being obviously you know smart about it and not saying anything stupid but I I told her that you know just without and she understands but I just want to know what the problem or if it's a problem at all but why does this happen you know I love her to death but that's just a problem that I keep having. Just right after. Well, what do you focus on? Is there is there a part of her that you don't like? No, no, I I love everything about her. You know, it's it's nothing. You know, physical. It's just just for that split second, I just get that feeling that you know, I it's not an attraction thing, but more like I I just don't want to see you know her. I just want to leave. You know, maybe you're right about going and getting some food. Yeah, that'll help. Nah, yeah. It sounds like you have some ambivalence about the the relationship. Maybe on some level you're not real conscious of at this point. And Probably. Maybe the I mean, maybe I'm, the I'm, commitment. Are you thinking of marrying this gal, or what do you well, think? Well, I I haven't really thought about it. You know, I'm still 19, still have my education to look forward to. Is this your first girlfriend? Uh, no, it's not actually. You've, uh, uh, you've it's it's my first girl girlfriend that I have sex with. Oh yeah. Uh, uh, there's a, there's a bunch of weird feelings that go on. Then I remember. Right. You know, when I first started having consistent sex at 32, <laughs> that uh, a lot of ambivalent feelings, you know. For some people, there's a feeling of uh, permanence in a relationship when you're having sex. The, maybe in your mind somewhere, the fact that you're having sex with her implies that this is a commitment that's more than just, well, I'm 19, I got other things to do. And so there's some real conflict uh, in your mind about you're sexually uh, intimate with her, and yet you really don't have that kind of a commitment. Oh, just, just listen. Is a, is a he, 19-year-old guy... I'm not saying what he should do. I'm saying it sounds like he's got some real ambivalence there. Because that's to have that disgusted feeling right after that kind of intimacy, that, you know, wanting, being hungry, stuff like that for, well, for even you. You know, everyone's always talking about <clears throat> trusting yourself and trusting your instincts and following your heart. At 19, don't listen to yourself at all. You got a lot of horrible ideas. You you can trust your instincts, but not your impulses. A lot of crazy stuff runs through your head at 19. You got a lot of hormones I going be su- on. You, you know, there's there's a lot of weird ideas you have. I wouldn't be surprised if she's more. Uh, you know, assuming this is more of a permanent thing than he is possibly. And well, he loves her. Right. He just sees he's a crazy like uh, you know. Doctor, uh, I mean, uh, Mr. Hyde kind of uh, thoughts. Right. Well, maybe she's okay with the fact that he's thinking, well, yeah, six months, we'll, you know, get off this ship, get get on something else, try something else. I mean, can, for women, it's like, well, I'm going to marry this guy. It's Let me permanent. say this. Let me say this. You know, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde? Uh-huh. Doesn't Dr. Jekyll sound worse than Mr. Hyde, just as names <laughs> go? Like, if someone just said, hey, you want to hang out with Dr. Jekyll or Mr. Hyde? You'd probably hang with Mr. Hyde, wouldn't you? Oh, boy. I'm just saying, I think they should have come up with a nicer name for Dr. Jekyll and and then a meaner name for Mr. Hyde. You see see what Mm -hmm. I mean? Dr. Hyde and Mr. Jekyll. That's that would have worked, but it would have been more effective. Fifteen seconds. That is. But how? Why is that a big problem? Fifteen seconds. I mean, if he's of disgust. No, he said. Listen, Uh, possibly. You got it. I think. Don't if listen we to ask, anyone on this If we show. ask Danny about his girlfriend's intentions in the relationship, I would assume that she's probably got a little more permanence in mind than maybe no, he's feeling. No, please. Stop feeling. that. He loves her. Ooh, yeah, who cares? Who cares? All right, let's uh, take ourselves a break. Uh, talk to Brian. His dad's a porno nut when we come back. Oh, good. Yeah? Yeah, that's a good one. All right, after she's this. She's on mom, too. All right. Mom's oh, really? Yeah. Oh, good. After this. Hey, everybody. Love Line. I'm Adam Carolla. That is uh, Dr. Bruce over there. Doing an adequate job tonight, filling in for Dr. Drew. I've had anal sex, and I passed out a couple times. Very, very rare. Can you make another recording? That was a, uh, a revelation <laughs> that uh, 
Bruce thought he was telling me off the air last time he was in the show, but Anderson had the mics on. How about an I've had oral sex up. and whatever. Got anything else? Uh, anything else for Bruce in the uh, menu of no? perversions and obscenities? Obscenities. We are uh, talking about uh, racing tonight, IndyCar uh, racing, uh, most specifically. It, there it is. That did sound like an IndyCar going by. Oh, no, that, that sounded like a NASCAR mm. going by. Hey, don't you hate when you're uh, watching a show and they, uh, you know, they always put the car sound in later and they put the wrong engine in for the car? <laughs> you guys get pissed off at that? Uh -huh. All right, let's uh, see if we can... Uh, this is a good one. Yeah, all right. Well, wait a minute. I thought we were going to talk to... Uh, Brian. A woman with a nitro question. I like that. All right, but hold on a second, okay. though, because I, uh, we'll go to that next. But okay. I, I, yeah, I sold Brian before we went to break. All right. That's radio. Brian? Yeah. Hey, hold on. we got to get this nitro question. Okay. No, go ahead. Your dad uh, watches a lot of porno. Yeah, he's a porno freak, like completely. Yeah. All he does is, like, uh, spends a lot of our money on porno. And, uh, no. No, he does not. I, he does. How do you know? Because it's all over the house. No, it is not. I swear it is. He keeps it on the, in the living room table, uh, DVDs in the den by the computer, Playboy, penthouse, everything. And he spends a substantial portion of your income on this? Well, probably not. But okay. Brian, you're describing Adam's house and lifestyle, so it's going to be very yeah. difficult for him to be objective how, about how this. How dare time. you attack my ways? And uh, let's see a Tampa 2 theme song. Stop that, or I'll begin <laughs> masturbating. So, listen, you uh very Pavlovian that way. Yeah, Brian, so what, is he cheating on your mom? Yeah, he's also cheating. <laughs> How do you know? Well, on the computer, he leaves pictures of himself naked at other people's houses, and he doesn't know that we know about it, but I haven't told my mom yet, and I'm wondering if I should, because... What do you mean he leaves pictures of himself he, naked? He, like, has pictures of himself naked on the computer mm -hmm. from other people's houses and I know it's like an escort service because oh. if you look at his web page oh. history he's got uh, like porno escort services and stuff on there alright I bet your mom knows about this you think so? yeah I, I think she does and uh, you, do you hate him? well yeah my sister hates him too he's, <laughs> yeah he's, sounds, he's, sounds like his, does he do drugs or booze or something? no really? Yeah. He's New York, and so. <laughs> but he's from New York. Yeah. Oh. So am I. Yeah. I'm pretty poor on my house. Hey, does does yeah. he have any in? Oh, you no. keep in the car, right? <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> does he have any here. insight into his problem? Does he think he has a problem at all? Oh yeah. He's found, I don't know. found I, Jesus I, three years ago. Yeah. He seems comfortable with all this <laughs> porn, but. Hey, hey, Brian. Yeah. Here's your uh, here's your move. I realized uh, my parents were idiots when I was. Uh, well, actually, it was just after I was born. I was right about, and the umbilical cord was still attached. And here's what you have to do. You're 16, right? Yeah. You're not going to change your dad. He's not going to listen to you. You could get into boundaries and all that stuff, but he just sounds like a world-class jackass. You need to do well in school and go far, far away to college and try not to go gay. That's that'll, that'll be your first impulse to screw up your dad, but don't do it. Just go far away to college, start your own family. And then eventually you'll start leaving porn around the house. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Two, it'll be one of those crazy here's an things. Alternate, here's an alternate plan, Brian. What your dad's got is a progressive disorder. And as much as Adam might not like to agree with, with me on this, uh, this type of behavior with sex is addictive. And addictive behaviors are progressive. And it's going to take more and more of this type of activity to get him to the same level of excitement. And it's I obviously... agree with all that. Okay, it's destroying your family. And just as you do interventions with someone that's destroying a family with drugs and alcohol, you can do the same type of intervention with somebody like your dad. And what you're saying in an intervention is you're getting a professional to come in and help you say to him, look, we see what you're doing. You're destroying yourself. You're destroying our family. And we're not going to tolerate it. And a lot of times what the word tolerance is actually enabling you. Yeah, but what's he supposed to do? Well, get together with mom and sister. And th this guy's old enough. He's he's an adult, basically. It's 16. And, and being exposed to this, what you're doing is you're saying, we're not going to live in the same house with this Wait, if you don't get help. You know mom's a piece of work, no, too. Brian, mom's an enabler. Mom's... Well, that's what I'm saying. Well, Brian? My sister screwed up, too. <laughs> yeah, how's your mom doing? Uh, she's just, like, the nicest person in the family. All right, can she, can she muster some strength and... Uh, you know, set some boundaries up for this guy? 
Uh, I don't know. I, I'm beginning to think that she doesn't even care that he looks at all this porn because she's so used to it. Sure she cares. She's deeply hurting about all this. Uh, and what you need to do yeah, is... Yeah, but her the, dad's an idiot, there's too. There's more to it. There's more. There's a lot more to it. There's uh, a lot know. of abuse. Wait a second. Brian, right. what he needs to do is uh, look right. in the phone book. You can find the same place you find Alcoholics Anonymous information. You find Sexaholics Anonymous or that type of a 12-step organization. And there are support groups or families with an right. idiot like this. All right, we'll do the it. The guy's sick and he needs help. I, listen, I, I agree. I'm just I'm just a little more realistic. I know his mom's a mess. I know her dad was a world-class jackass who probably abused her. Now she met an abusive idiot who's halfway to hell. This guy's practically graduated high school. Just get, get, get I, your you grades up and get the hell out of there, and hopefully the place burns down. People like this are in a world of hurt, and I've seen people like this say when they get help, I wish somebody would have stepped up to the plate and told you know and said, look, I see that you have a problem, and there is, and offered them help. Yeah. I've seen people thank well, that, the that's that true. does the intervention. I mean, that's so. true for everybody, and every, every you know, it's true. Every, everybody on death row wishes someone would have stepped in at a certain point and steered them a different direction. So if the family gets together and they get somebody to help them confront him in a loving way and say, look, there is help, but we're not going to continue to even live in the same house with All us. Right. So good, then, good luck getting a codependent mom to go in on that. Codependent That's mom needs saying. support, and she needs to go to some... So will you get an intervention for her to get on board with the intervention? Uh, if... No. You get right, somebody that knows about to sit down with a three and she'll she'll mm -hmm. want to do it. You're twenty seven. Yes, I am. You drive a nitro truck? Yeah, I had just a couple statements. Have you been in the pits at a race? At a at a drag race? Yes. Yeah. And yeah. do you sign your waivers before you go in those pits? No, I didn't sign any waiver. Well then something's wrong because you're supposed to sign a waiver before you go in those pits. You guys don't realize how many safety precautions that we have to take. <sighs> Yeah, yeah. Oh no, I I saw it. There was a uh, there was a uh, piece of orange yarn in between me and the uh, twenty thousand horsepower nitro burning a grenade that was uh, ten feet away from me. Very dangerous over there. Very dangerous. No, what do you? What? What? what why is a waiver? Why is that a safety precaution? That's just so I don't sue when the thing blows up and I get a, a blower belt up my ass. That. Be, that's why you signed the waiver because you're assuming all liability for you to be down yeah, there. I, 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 I know, but hold on there, Nitro Mama. I'd like to get a look at this hey, one. You took by the me way. in those pits. You didn't tell me she's got like that thrush muffler tattoo on her boob. <laughs> but li listen, uh, here's uh, here's all I'm saying. You arguing about uh, how safe things are and then explaining the waiver part is is not it's not a great argument. Do you know what I mean? She was saying that it's safe in the pits and then saying you need to sign a waiver in case something exploded. That's all yeah. I'm saying. All right, we'll take a break.